Welcome to Automotive Life. This channel is about lifestyle, passion, and business. And today we're going to be doing a video about how to get your dealer's license and how to become a used car dealer. Now I've seen so much horrific bad information all over the internet and YouTube that just had me dying laughing. Half these people I know for a fact are not in business. So today I wanted to kind of give you steps on how I got my dealer's license, how I got banks, flooring companies, and the steps to do that and kind of give you a good breakdown. Now we're going to have 10 steps. Some of the videos I'm going to make going a little bit more in the depth so this way you can get a better understanding of some of the individual steps. But today it's going to be more of a brief synopsis on uh, what to do as far as getting your license. This video may be probably, I'm guessing, 10 to 15 minutes long, but I guarantee you it's worth the wait. Go ahead and watch it from start to end and we'll get into that. The first thing we're going to talk about is disclaimers. Now, is big money important to start a dealership? No but it will help you immensely if you do start out with a little bit of capital. A lot of the things that we're gonna be getting into are all the little dollar things that creep up out of nowhere that cost you money. And I would say to be successful, to at least have at least 30 grand in the bank just for operating expenses will help you immensely. You don't have to have it, I know it's kinda of high, but I would recommend at least saving up around $30,000 to get the whole process started, um, unless you have family members or an investor. Um, second thing is credit. Now, is credit a big part of you becoming a dealer? 100% yes. Um, I won't go too much into specifics because I'll go through them in each individual step, but credit plays a huge part as, you, as far as you getting approved on banks, flooring lines, who will do business with you, who will not do business with you. It's very, very important. Whether you're a buy here, pay here lot or you want to go out and do retail, credit is extremely important. I would say probably more important than the money aspect. So make sure that you work on your credit before you start this process. And the uh, third uh, heads up is your DMV license. What is a dealer's license? Now a dealer's license is a privileged license. Now with any privileged license, there are certain uh, uh, criteria and requirements that you need to fit as being a dealer, depending on which state you're from. And I don't wanna see a lot of you guys spend a lot of money and find out you guys get denied down the road. So I'm gonna give you three examples of things you need to check out before you start and before you start any of the steps we're about to discuss. First one is felony. If you have a felony, I'd say about 80% of the states you will automatically be denied, whether it's one year old or 10 years old. They do not care. If you have a felony, they don't care what it is, they will probably turn you down. So make sure you check with your state, the state licensing department and the DMV and if that is allowed. Second one, which is a big thing here in Las Vegas and Nevada, is DUIs. If you have a DUI or too many DUIs, they will automatically cancel your license. And as part of the privilege license, privileges license can be revoked at any time. So if you get, let's say you get denied your dealership license because you don't have, or you do have a DUI, or you wind up getting a DUI down the road, they could take your license away and take your livelihood away. So it's very important to pay attention to that. So once again, check with your state and your city and the DMV and see what the requirements are for your area. And the last one is uh, traffic violations. It's something as simple as a parking ticket. If you get a lot of parking tickets, you got a few reckless driving tickets and uh, just some other uh, traffic violations, they will actually deny you uh, your dealer's license. So once again, it's also important, check with the DMV, check with the state before you get started. Okay, step number one, picking a name. It's something so simplistic, but so many people screw it up. Now, what you wanna do is find something that's good for your area. So let's say you live in Dallas, Texas. You wanna search maybe Texas Auto Sales. If that's not available, maybe Dallas Auto Sales. Something that organically Google can search that is a very clean, popular name. You don't wanna use acronyms because it makes it harder for you to search and it just it's not very uh, rememberable. Also, you wanna do is check on all the social media platforms, see if that name's available. And then once you pick that, check the website. Once you get all those things, you're gonna start doing kind of like a background check on your name to make sure that maybe somebody in that city or the city next to you didn't have it. So let's say you pick Bob's Auto Sales and you find out that Bob's Auto Sales existed five years ago in your town, but the guy was a shyster, has a bunch of bad reviews and everything else. And now, once you start your new Google page, that bad information will merge with yours. So you wanna stay away from that. Also, a lot of your vendors will Google you before they start doing business with you. And the last thing you need to do is have an issue with maybe one of your vendors or one of the banks not wanting to sign you up because they think you're uh, 
were doing business with this shady company before. So very important to double check those things. Okay, step number two is getting your licensing and your corporation all stuff together. So I recommend before you do any of this, talk to an attorney, talk to your financial advisor, see what the best one is for you. So when you get your corporation, you can get an LLC, S Corp, C Corp, whatever you know you guys recommend or decide. Second thing is your, um, your state license. Every state is gonna be different. Here in the state of Nevada, you have to have a state license, a county license, city license, a DMV license, seller reseller's license, uh, resale tax, EIN, there's, there's six or seven different licensing you're gonna need. So make sure you find out all those steps in whatever state or city you live in, so make sure you fill it out all correctly. Um, and uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is bond and insurance. These two are extremely important when it comes to money and credit, because both things decide on your premium and how much money you have to pay up in the beginning. So every state is gonna require you to have a bond. The bond is to protect the customer if the dealer does something shady. So in the state of Nevada, um, I have to have a $100,000 bond. Now, my credit was, I'd say, a little bit above good, and I only had to pay $1,000 for my $100,000 bond. Now, a friend of mine that's only 70 points different in credit from where I'm at, his bond, he had to pay $9,000 for the year. So just 70 points made him pay, a, I mean, a huge amount of difference in his bond. So make sure that you start working on your credit today. And if you're anxious to get started, just get ready. Your bond may be very high, pay it, but make sure before the next year comes up, you lower, uh, you raise your credit score, lower your debt, do whatever you have to do to get that better credit. Second thing is your insurance. Now your insurance is gonna be based on your state requirements, which you need to find out. The second thing is you're gonna have a garage keeper's policy, which is gonna protect your stuff. You're gonna have uh, the insurance that's gonna cover your plates. So that covers you, your drivers, uh, your customers, stuff like that. And then if you get a flooring line, you may be required to have full coverage on all that. So I pay about $15,000 a year for my insurance. Now, since I have a little bit better than uh, average or, or better credit, I only pay, I think I pay about maybe three or $4,000 down and I pay maybe eight, 900 bucks a month for the rest of the months. Now, if you have bad credit, this, the guy I was just talking about earlier, his insurance was $12,000 and he had to pay it all up front at once. So you wanna make sure that you're somewhere on the spectrum of okay to good credit, because if you're in the bad credit, it's gonna cost you double to get started. So make sure, like I said, credit is king, cash is kind of secondary, which is funny. Okay, step number three is picking a location. This is one of the things that's very, very critical in the success of your dealership and the longevity of your business. Now, I'm gonna break it up in two categories. There's a lot more, but I usually say there's, I'd say about 50% what we call warehouse dealers, a little bit smaller, cheaper overhead. And then you have your storefront dealers that are like in a busy intersection, side of a freeway, something along that, those lines. So there's pros and cons to each of them. Now with the warehouse dealers, let's say for fun, your rent's only three grand a month and the uh, uh, busy intersection ones are five grand. So business 101, you wanna keep your overhead low, but this is one of the few times I'm gonna disagree with that. I always say pay a little bit more for a better location. It'll help your sales out tremendously. So my very first dealership was a warehouse location and we had 80 cars parked in in the side parking lot. I was spending about three to $4,000 a month and we were getting like a lot of sales. We thought we were doing great, everything was good, but we had a few bad months, and when you don't have three to $4,000 to spend in, in marketing, my sales almost got cut in half. So we moved to a, a storefront. When you first moved in, money was a little bit tight, but I'll tell you what, in that first month, we sold just as much as we did with the three, $4,000 marketing as we did with this. So the very next month, we put three, $4,000 into it and we doubled our sales. So the storefronts are always a better way to go. It costs a little bit more money, but just in case if you have a bad month, you can actually get a lot of drive-by traffic to keep the revenue coming in. And one of the big things that helps you when it comes to having like a nice frontage lot or storefront lot is the banks and the vendors. Now, a lot of, uh, Flooring companies, uh, bankers, and some of the other vendors you use will not do business with you if you're in a warehouse. If you're in a warehouse, they think you're not there for long term, you know, you're, you're gonna go out of business, they just don't take you seriously. And I'm telling you this from experience. I had 80 cars on my lot, and some of the banks told me flat out they would not do business with me because I was in a warehouse. 
And once I got my storefront, everything changed. All the banks signed us up. We had a lot better traffic, better customers. You know, we were a lot easier to find. So I always recommend trying to get a better spot. And um, when you're getting your, uh, picking your spot, you also want to talk to the realtor. Make sure you get in your lease that you will complete um, move in and complete your lease upon approval of dealer's license. Because remember, the dealer's license is a privileged license. So if for some reason you get declined, you don't want to be stuck with a three, four year lease and getting sued by your landlord. So that's crucial. The second thing is, is make sure that your place is zoned for that type of business. Now every city and every state has different recommendations, but here in the state of Nevada, if it's not a dealership before, you have to get a special use permit and you have to go in front of city council. And I have a friend that's doing that right now and it took him six months to get it approved. And the whole time he was uh, paying rent at his spot to keep it going. So make sure you pick the right places get your lease set up and take the time and really pick a great spot. Even though it may stretch your budget a little bit to get the nicer storefront lot, I guarantee you, you'll be much happier with it. Okay, step number four is a very, very important step. So I'm gonna kind of lean into the camera and express the emphasis on how important this is. Step number four is meeting with the DMV. So once you finish your paperwork, you pick a spot, they're gonna actually come out and do what's called a site inspection. So what you need to do is make sure you put your best foot forward. Go to your lot, organize all your cars, wash them, put your stickers on them. Um, if you got some friends, tell them to go home, put on some khakis, put on a tie. You yourself, shave, get cleaned up, put on a tie. Your office, put a uh, coat of paint on it, put some nice uh, IKEA furniture in there, put some posters on the wall, look presentable. Greet them at their car. You wanna make sure that you put the best foot forward because the people that are coming to do your site inspection are also the people that are gonna come investigate you every time you have a complaint. And if there's any dealers watching this, they'll tell you, DMV does not play. They can fine you a lot of money or they just take your license from you. So it is extremely important you put your best foot forward. So like I said, you walk up to them, you greet them at the car. Hi, I'm so-and-so with Bob's Auto Sales. This is my sales floor. This is my sales staff. Please come into my office. You know, be very friendly, show them around. They're gonna take some pictures. They're gonna ask you a few questions. Be very personable. Leave a positive memory in these people's minds because you gotta remember, DMV investigators have two jobs. They do site inspections and they chase down shady dealers. And you wanna do as much as you can to set yourself apart from those type of dealerships. So whatever you gotta do to be presentable and be professional, put that little bit of extra effort in there because I'm telling you, that is crucial for your dealership success. Okay, step number six is flooring lines. Now, flooring lines are a double-edged sword. They can help your business grow, but they can also put you in financial ruin. So let's go ahead and get into kind of a breakdown. Um, basically, there's two major companies, AFC and Nextgear. Those are the two big players on the market. There's a lot of small secondary ones like ABS, um, Floor Plan Express, and a lot of the mom and pops ones that may be in your area. I always recommend signing up one of the big companies and then also one of the small mom and pop companies. So this way you never keep all your eggs in one basket. So if something were ever to happen, they either close you down your line or they shrink your line or whatever else, you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Most of the flooring companies will try to force you to go with just one, but never do it. Always have two to three of them. So you, you can never, if you lose one, you won't be basically screwed. Having a flooring line is a great thing. It let me go from 30 cars all the way up to 150 cars but also it's a double-edged sword. Like we're saying, you'll have curtailment payments, you know, on a two to $300,000 line, you could be paying 20 to 30 grand a month in curtailment payments. And that's where the cash comes involved. If you don't have a decent enough chunk of money to put in your account to make sure that you can cover those cars, those curtailments are big because if you don't pay it or you're late on your flooring line, they don't say, oh, it's okay. We'll give you another seven days. They basically charge your account if it bounces there's gonna be some guy that's gonna show up to your dealership the very next day. He's gonna tell you to get the, he's gonna get all the keys from your dealership and he's gonna be back in two days for a check. And if you don't give him that check, they're gonna take all the cars off their lot. So it's very important that before you sign up, you understand completely the ramifications of a flooring line. I'm gonna make a second video specifically just 100% for flooring lines because the payments, the interest, the fees, it's very, very complicated. And if you don't get it right, or set up right the very first time, you're gonna spend a lot of money and lose a lot of money. So we wanna go more in depth into that a little bit later. Step number five, 
getting signed up with auction access. Now, once you've DMV has approved you, they're gonna give you an eight to 12 digit number. You're gonna take that number to auction access. You're either gonna fill it out online or you're gonna actually go into a storefront and fill it out. Now, once they have your information, this is what gets you the availability to sign up with all the other auctions in your area and nationwide. So once you get that done, auction access, you go to Mannheim, you get signed up at Mannheim, signed up at Odessa, ABS, Copart, IAA, all the little mom and pop uh, auction houses that are next to you. I really strongly suggest making sure you sign up with all of them because you never know where the deals are at and every market is different. Perfect example, I bought a car just last week at, at Copart. And Copart usually has you know, salvage rebuild vehicles, which is good for if you want to do a buy here, pay here lot, looking for some cheap cars, but I'm a retail lot. I bought a, a 2018 Challenger, clean title, bumper was torn off of it and the fender was damaged. That was it. I got it almost nine grand back a book. So there are some extremely good deals and places you don't really think about going. So make sure to sign up for every auction and take the time to go back and forth and see what each auction is about. At least visit each auction at least once a month. So this way you can kind of feel what the market is in your area. All right, step number eight is buying cars at the auction. So you got your flooring line set up. Let's say they gave you $200,000 and you got 10 grand in your pocket and your bank's already gave you your little list of uh, you know, cars, they want you to stay in these parameters, so make sure you only buy in that box. So we go to the auction, I tell everybody, volume over anything. So if I go to your lot and I see, let's say 10 nice Mercedes, that's cool, but you wanna have 30 cheap cars on your lot. And the reasoning is, is yes, to have 10 nice cars is nice, but when you have 30 cars, you bring in more people, more opportunities to sell, more opportunities to either upscale or downscale a customer. Um, the more cars you have, like I said, just seems to bring in more people. And as long as you have more on your lot, you'll have more access to the banks, more access to customers. And it's kind of the, it's the Walmart theory. You just want to get a few bucks and volume, just volume, volume, volume. Now, if you want to be based on a gross model and you just want to do... 10 cars, high-end cars outside of a warehouse, you can. I don't recommend it until you've been in the business for about a year or so. When you really got it fine-tuned, you know what cars sell for what, you can constantly buying those high-end cars for cheap pricing, then I would recommend that. There's a lot of my friends, that's all they do. They have a nice warehouse, they have maybe 10, 15 vehicles, and it's just one guy. He doesn't do any recon because they're all high-end cars, and he sells like two cars a month, rips maybe three, four grand on each one, just hangs out and enjoys his time. So you can be the high-end dealer like that, but I always tell people start off with the volume model first, get a lot of cheap cars, get your experience with the bankers, get your experience with buying the cars, try to buy stuff that's clean, stay away from recon because every time you buy a car with recon, your expenses just keep going up if you don't have a big facility where you can put a mechanics bay, now you're sending your cars out to get repaired and you're using a third party mechanic and it just gets higher and higher and higher. And a lot of cars that have a lot of recon, they wind up just eating up all your profit and your time. So just try to get cars that you know that drive pretty good, take your time, buy them from the auction. You know, I buy a lot of cars off of Craigslist because if I buy them from regular people, you can get more of the story, you can drive them on the street, you can pay a little bit more attention. So I have actually better luck buying cars off of Craigslist than I do buying them at the auction. Step number seven is one of those very important steps, which is meeting with the bankers. Now, meeting with the bankers is gonna set up your long-term success. The more banks you have, the more buying power you have, and I recommend not buying a lot of cars until you talk to the bankers, because they're gonna tell you to stay in a certain parameter, and you need to make sure you do that. So let me get into this. So basically, every banker you meet is gonna say, hey, we buy cars between uh, you know, 2008, in 2018. We'll buy cars as low as $5,000, but no more than 15. We'll buy cars from you know zero miles all the way up to 110,000 miles. Each bank that you talk to is gonna give you a different parameter on what they're gonna buy. And you need to put this in mind when you go to the auction. So as you start looking at cars, you're gonna start narrowing down to what the banks buy. And this is what I call as your lending wheel. And as long as you stay inside this lending wheel, you will never have a problem selling cars to your banks. Now, a lot of people get really caught up in popular cars 
you know, I want Mercedes, BMWs, Audis, uh, I want a WRX, I want this, I want a bunch of Wranglers. And those are all great cars, but they tend to be on a little bit more pricey side and risk side. And depending on how they look with bad credit is really gonna harm them. Now, I recommend getting uh, three to five banks in each category. You're gonna have prime, subprime, and you're gonna have uh, deep prime. And basically some of the banks, you know, Westlake, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Honor Financial, uh, Quality Acceptance, CIG, uh, High Performance Capital, CBS, CRS, uh, PAC. There's each, each area is gonna have different banks. Make sure you have three to five in every category because remember, the more banks you have, the more buying power you have. And 70% of your customers are just gonna have awful credit. And people with the worst credit are always gonna want the nicest cars. So if you fill your lot full of Mercedes and BMWs, you're gonna be in for a world full of hurt. And most people don't know this, but when you, uh, you sell a deal to a bank, they actually charge you money depending on how much the customer uh, is at risk. So here's a perfect example. Let's say you buy an 09 E-Class Mercedes for $3,000, okay? And at that same time, you buy a 2013 Impala for $3,000. Both cars cost the same. You're selling them both for $5,000, okay? Let's say Mr. John Smith has bad credit and short job time. On the Impala, they're gonna be like, okay, well he has bad credit and short job time, we're gonna charge you $1,000 to buy the deal. So now, they're gonna cut you a check for $4,000. You're not gonna get five, only four. But every car that you sell comes with what's called a credit risk and a uh, car risk. There's two things that, that count in every single uh, deal, car risk and credit risk. So now let's move on to the 2009 Mercedes. Well, we already know John Smith has bad credit, so let's whack off $1,000. And well, this Mercedes is let, has a higher risk emblem because the first breakdown he has, I don't, we don't know if the customer can afford the, the repairs or the insurance is higher. So he runs a higher risk of not paying his insurance. So the bank sees that as a bigger risk. So now they're gonna charge you, let's say $1,000 to buy the deal. So now on this $5,000 car, they're gonna charge you $2,000 to buy the deal. You're not making any money. Where on this, you know, cheap Impala, it's not as risky. It's just a regular car, but they know that any AutoZone, O'Reilly's, or whatever junkyard has parts for these cars, compared to the Mercedes, is much more of a risk. Now, every car you go through is going to be a different risk emblem, and the customers be completely different. Some people you may may want to buy that. I mean, may get a lower rate on the Mercedes than they will on the uh, Impala. It changes from customer to customer. But I would say about a large majority of your customers are gonna fall into that realm. If you stick them in a Highline car, you're gonna fail and your buying fees are gonna go up, your profits are gonna go down, and your recon is gonna go way up. So, you know, I'm not saying don't buy any, but if, what I do is I buy, I call them bait cars. I have a few Land Rovers, a few uh, Mercedes, some BMW, some Audis. You know, I have them sprinkled in. Maybe, maybe 5% of my inventory is European cars or Highline cars. Everything else is regular because they may come for the Mercedes, but they're gonna wind up leaving in a Kia Optima because the bank does not trust them to make the payments on that Mercedes. So make sure you have a good balance of uh, cheap cars, expensive cars, high mileage, low mileage, American, Japanese, Korean, and then German. So as long as you kind of keep that in mind, you should be all right because the banks do not like to buy those type of cars. So only buy what the banks want you to buy. Step number 10 is all about marketing. You wanna make sure you capture all your social media marketing, Facebook, Instagram, Yelp, Google, all those things. Not only do you wanna post, but you wanna make interactive comments. If you wanna make memes, I love doing videos. Videos are a lot more interactive. If people can see your personality through the camera, they seem to tend to buy a little bit more from you. Um, also, Craigslist is a big thing for me. Um, if you, you have to stay consistent. Consistency is the key. You constantly wanna be posting. So I post about three times in the morning, three times at lunch, and three times when I go home. Now, if you get really busy and you don't have the time, um, one of the things that we did once we got a little bit bigger and we got 150 cars, I can't post them all. Um, there's a lot of uh, systems that automatically post for you. Um, a good one is Hammer. 
Another one is V12, another one is CPS. Um, these things basically scrape your DMS, so they take all the cars and they post them on like Craigslist, Facebook, Instagram, Yelp, you know, offer up whatever like apps that you guys have in your area. They basically sell everything. So it costs a few bucks, but I'll tell you what, it's 100% worth it. If you're doing it and you've tried it for a month, don't get scared, consistency. Keep putting it out there. If you don't got big money, put 100 bucks on Facebook and let it just run and just keep doing it. When I first did it, everybody laughed at me. Everybody thought I was stupid. Fast forward seven years later, all my friends are trying to catch up to where I'm at now because they just started doing Facebook and now I'm doing Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Google, like everything else like that is, is pretty much the key. So constantly work on your marketing methods. Get those cars out there. Um, another thing you wanna do, try to get involved in your community some way where there's a good way you can market yourself. You know, whether it's offering free oil changes for veterans to maybe giving a car away once, maybe every six months, if you can afford it. You know, you really wanna build your brand. So step number 10 is not only for marketing, but it's really building your brand, letting people know that not only are you there to sell cars, but you're there to help people. And once you kind of get that thing going and people like you, when you're a dealer that people like, it's so much easier to sell cars. When people come to our lot, they're laughing, they're joking, they, they probably saw one of our funny videos, and they come just with their, their guards down, they're not all you know tightened up uh, into a ball and just thinking that everybody's gonna rip them off, where I go to one of my friends' dealerships you know, and they, they Google their address, next thing you know, they see 70 bad reviews and three good ones, you know, they're like already thinking they're gonna get screwed. So make sure every time you sell a car, you grab the customer and you say, hey, I'm gonna give you $20 and a gas card or a gift card. Can you give me a Facebook review, a Yelp review, a Google review, like whatever. Tell them to do them all and, and have a computer right by the door. So when you're, I'm gonna pull your car out and I'm gonna put gas in it. Can you go ahead and fill that out for me? And just go and people will fill it out. They'll leave you positive reviews and it works. Like I said, it'll take about 90 days but once all your positive reviews come up, like we're a 4.9 on Google review, it's huge. I got franchise dealers that spend $20,000, $30,000 a month in Google AdWords and we keep popping up ahead of them just because of the reviews. And especially now that YouTube is getting bigger, make sure that you start filming some of the reviews, post it on YouTube on your business page. Step number nine is getting your dealership set up. What I mean by that is you're gonna get your, all your paperwork, your banners, so you're gonna have to go to DMV, get your sales placards, you know, stuff like that. You're gonna get uh, all your special uh, pamphlets from each bank. Each bank's gonna have certain requirements on certain documents, and you need to have those all organized in, in every sales desk. Uh, the, the very big thing about getting open up is picking a DMS. Now, your DMS, your server, uh, or if you want to call it your software, is the most important thing you're going to pick as far as running your deals. So I use Dealer Center. Dealer Center is a web-based system that basically keeps all your inventory, does your marketing, does everything all in one uh, single package. And it's very, very user-friendly and it is constantly being updated. And that's why I like it. So whether you're at home, you're at the auction, you're sitting here with your phone going over stuff, you can do everything from Dealer Center on there. Now the next one below that is uh, Dealer Track. Similar concept, you know, it's web-based. I personally don't like it, but I would recommend signing up for a free trial to try it out and see. Um, the next one is Frasier. A lot of old school dealers use Frasier because it's very numbers oriented and it's, it's, they say it's simple to work, but I don't really like it. I Once you go like dealer center, it's very hard because it's, it's very intuitive. Um, depending on which one you pick, you can pay annually, um, monthly, or they may charge you per item or per thing you do. What I mean by that is like I have, my dealer system costs $575 a month but I have uh, auto check, my marketing's tied up to there, I have a smart website. Every time you click on a car, it lets me know what car you looked at, how long you've been there, if what website you came from. So it's very intuitive. Um, every time you run credit, it charges you 25 to 75 cents. Every time you print out a contract, it costs you $2. 
Um, there's various little things, so make sure you read over it and you try all these ones. Most of them, like right now, you can go online, you could sign up for a free 30-day trial, and you could try them out and see which one you like. So I truly recommend Dealer Center because it's everything in the one and it's very easy to use and it's the one that's constantly being upgraded. A lot of these other ones like Frasier, when I first got into the business like in the early 2000s, I think it's the exact same model that's been used then is now. So try them out, see which one you like and then pick the one you want and don't worry about it. All that stuff, if you don't like it, you can always switch it later. All the DMSs pull from each other. So go from there. Hey guys, thanks for staying the whole way through and watching the video. I just wanted to leave you with an end note. Um, I've been in the industry my whole life. I love cars. I love the industry. Hence why we decided to make automotive life. Um, you know, I started flipping cars when I was like 16. I would go to the uh, tow yard auctions and buy cars. Uh, my parents used to make fun of me because we'd go buy them and bring these buckets home and they would just look at us like, what the hell are you doing? I've been a dealer pretty much the last five years. Um, we have two dealerships here in Las Vegas, uh, rental car company, body shop, mechanic shop. Um, we pretty much do everything here. And it's really not that hard. I, we started with pretty much next to nothing. We've had a lot of rough roads, but that's why I decided to make a few of these videos to kind of reach out to people and let them know that their dreams are not that hard to get. And like I said, there's so much bad information. Um, you know, I'm gonna try to do my best to help put out some of the stuff we're doing. This video I kind of just made as a, just a fluke. It's New Year's Eve, I'm getting ready to go out here in Vegas, and uh, I don't know, I watched one of these videos that one of my friends sent me, and it was awful. I mean, it was just, the guy, like I said, had no idea what, what it was like to be a dealer. So this one was kind of an impromptu. Um, the next video I make, but I wanted to just put this out to let people know. Um, if you have any questions or anything, put them in the comments. I'll make sure to answer every single one. However I can do to help. I know a lot of people don't like to share information because they're like, oh my God, you know, you're, you're bringing more competition to yourself. There's more than enough money to go around. Every year, the same dealers that we call competition, they usually do something shady and they wind up going out of business. So it's not that big of a deal. I like to have more educated, more intelligent, more outgoing uh, businesses to compete against because they don't make the same pitfalls. They don't overpay for cars. They don't you know, burn a bunch of banks, which makes my buy rights go higher. They don't burn the flooring companies, which brings my, my payments down lower. So consistency, as well as getting a better group of people to become dealers, I think would be much better uh, for our industry. And you know, with us being the new generation of dealers, you know, to, to kind of get out some of the older guys, you know, is, I don't know, it's rough. The old guys, I'll tell you what, I love them, the smartest guys you'll ever meet. Uh, I got this guy that's 85 years old, buy her, pay her a lot, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. You can ask him what his portfolio is, he'll tell you down to the dime on how much he is, what he lost, what his risk assessment is, if he sold his portfolio tomorrow. So, you know, my best advice for people, what I did is I not only read a lot online, I actually went and I took these dealers to lunch. Now some dealers will tell you to go screw yourself, they're not gonna give you any information, but some of these guys will, They'll, you just tell them, look, I'm a young guy, I wanna start up, take them to dinner, take them to lunch, don't ask them for free information, you know, tell, show them that you're genuine, you really wanna put you know, an effort into learning and befriend some of them. I have a few mentors here in Vegas. Um, I studied the dealership realm for two years before I actually opened up. And after I heard one pitfall after another of what they did wrong, I made sure not to do that. And that's why I'm sharing these with you. So this way, hopefully, you can start off your dealership world uh, or your dealership adventure uh, in success and hopefully in a positive way instead of some of these other ones where they're telling you to pay them $2.99 and get a dealer's plate and do cars out of your house. Yeah, don't do any of that stuff. Shady as hell. DMV will come. They'll take your cars from you. Sorry, I just dropped my phone. Um, the DMV will, will come take your cars, will take your plate, and if they put you on the black ball list, you can never be a dealer again. Good luck. Hit us up if you have anything else. Drop the comments. Follow us on Instagram at automotive.life, and we'll see you guys next time.